Hello and welcome to Useful Idiots. I'm Katie Halper. I'm Mary Matte. How's it going, everybody? How's it going, Katie? I'm good. You? I'm great. And we have a great show this week because we are joined by the former finance minister of Greece, Yanis Varoufakis, who has a new book out called Techno Feudalism What Killed Capitalism. And we are going to discuss that. We're going to discuss the crisis in Ukraine, which is taking a turn. And of course, the unfolding mass killings by Israel in Gaza. And his feelings on Bernie Sanders is less than stellar response to it. Yeah, spoiler alert, not a fan of what Bernie is saying these days. Yeah. Uh, and of course, become members and subscribers to the show so that you get the amazing Thursday throwdown feature that we do, which is your midweek dose of media madness, where we respond to media clips from the week. We try to uh, laugh instead of cry at them. And of course, you get extended interviews. And you can do that at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. And in this week's Thursday Throwdown, which you can get as a subscriber to the show at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com, we go through many funny clips, including Jake Tapper's latest monologue in defense of the Israeli campaign in Gaza. And his basic question is, or argument is, that what else can Israel do? It has no other options. That the only thing Israel can do is commit murder of more than 10,000 civilians and there's no other reasonable pro proposals on the table. Jake forgets a lot of options, which we're going to go through in this week's Thursday Throwdown. So let's get to our four basic food groups. What do we have for Democrat suck? So we have a Democrat suck that's also a Republican suck, which is the censuring of Rashida Tlaib. She is the Michigan Congresswoman, a Democrat, of course, and the only Palestinian American member of Congress. And she faced censure over comments uh, that she had made in a video. So the vote to censure her was two th that 234 to 188. The censure resolution was put forward by uh, Republican Congressman Richard McCormick of Georgia. He accused Slave of promoting false narratives regarding uh, October 7th and for calling for the, quote, destruction of the state of Israel. This is based on a video in which she accused uh, Biden of supporting the, quote, genocide of Palestinians, called on him to uh, support a ceasefire. And the video also included footage of a crowd chanting the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, which some people um, either ignorantly or cynically interpret as meaning uh, the genocide of Jewish people. She herself explained that that phrase is, quote, an aspirational call for freedom, human rights and peaceful coexistence, end quote, and she re refused to retract it. So uh, this is what she was uh, censured over. And the shameful thing is that 22 Democrats voted for her to be censured. And one of those Democrats is Rep. Richie Torres, one of APAC's favorites. He does a lot of pinkwashing of Israel. And here he is uh, being interviewed. During phrases like from the river to the sea, you're not simply advocating for the creation of a Palestinian state, you're advocating for the destruction of Israel as a Jewish state. And that crosses a line that no member of Congress should ever cross. It's hate speech, and Congress has a right to condemn it. It is outrageous. I am embarrassed for those Democrats who voted to censure their own colleague, who voted against free speech. It is an embarrassment. So, yeah, I'm going to agree with uh, Pramila Jayapal there and disagree with uh, Richie Torres. And, you know, it is just so rich that they're literally, as we speak, Israel is killing civilians, women, children, not distinguishing between Hamas and civilians. And we have members of Congress saying things like comparing Palestinian civilians to Nazis, saying that they're going to flatten Palestine into a parking garage. And those people aren't censured. The people who are censured are the people calling for human rights for Palestinians. And from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, is a call for equal rights for Muslims and Jews and Christians. There's nothing genocidal about that. But when you're invested in a theocratic state with the, which does not have equal rights, you don't want equal rights from the river to the sea. You want, to, uh, you want an Israeli occupation. So in short, call for genocide and support genocide, no censure. Right. Oppose genocide, call for equality. Censure. Yes. And 
Katie, would you be shocked to learn that all of these Democrats who voted with Republicans to censure Rashida Tlaib, all of them have received sizable amounts of money from pro-Israel lobby groups, including the aforementioned Richie Torres, who's received more than $340,000, and Josh Gottheimer of New Jersey, who's received $1.16 million from pro-Israel lobby groups. So- not congrats to them. Congrats to them. This, uh, on top of being, um, you know, showing your support for a mass murder campaign against the people of Gaza, you are reaping some rewards yeah. for your campaign. So yeah, it's good to have blood money under, yes. under your belt. Yeah. Well, keeping this going, let's turn to Republicans suck. And we're going to look at the Republicans who pushed this censure of Rashida Tlaib. The measure was heavily supported by Marjorie Taylor Greene. Censuring Representative Rashida Tlaib for anti-Semitic activity and sympathizing with terrorist organizations. Whereas in May 2019, Rashida Tlaib said that she celebrated the Holocaust and felt a calming feeling when thinking about the genocide of millions of Jews. It's such an insane lie that Rashida Tlaib celebrated the Holocaust. Yeah, what the fuck is she even talking about? Excuse my language. MTG. Not good with the facts on this one. No. Let's keep going. In 2020, Rashida Tlaib retweeted an illustration with the caption, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. And this Palestine Liberation Organization slogan has been adopted by Hamas and calls for the elimination of Israel and the death of all Jews. Whereas on November 3rd, 2023, Rashida Tlaib tweeted that, that the slogan from the river to the sea, which calls for the genocide of all Jews, is an aspirational call for freedom, human rights, and peaceful coexistence. Okay, so they want to censure Rashida Tlaib because she retweeted an image which contained the words from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. People want to pretend that this is a call for genocide. It's simply a call for equality. You know, you can say you support Israel as a Jewish state, but as long as you're willing to have the minimal honesty, that that means it's a supremacist state. That's what the Israeli group B'Tselem calls it, a Jewish supremacist right. state, because it's uh, privileging the rights of Jews over Palestinians who have happened to have been the majority indigenous population forever. And from the river to the sea is simply saying we don't accept the rights of one ethnicity to rule over another. And it's really a response to what's in the charter of the Likud party, uh, which is the party of Benjamin Netanyahu, which says this, the right of the Jewish people to the land of Israel is eternal and indisputable and is linked with the right to security and peace. Therefore, Judea and Samaria, and that means the West Bank, will not be handed to any foreign administration. Between the sea and the Jordan, there will only be Israeli sovereignty. So it's Netanyahu's party that says from the river to the sea, Palestine will be an apartheid state because Israel will rule over it and not allow a Palestinian state. And essentially, we are in control. So from the river to the sea is basically saying, no, we actually want to live in a state where everybody is equal. And you can only see that as a threat to you if you believe in a supremacist state, if you right. believe in apartheid. And Israel has recognized borders within the, the pre-1967 borders, but doesn't even accept those own borders. It doesn't even accept its own territory because it wants to rule over all of it, including the West Bank and Gaza. And so from the river to the sea, simply saying, let's free this land from the supremacist government, which Marjorie Taylor Greene, the entire Republican Party, and a lot of Democrats are lining up to support. And for being the only Democrat in Congress who's a Palestinian American who's calling all this out, who's opposing the mass murder campaign in Gaza, Rashid Tlaib gets censured. And let's hear from some more Republicans who made the case for why she deserves to be punished. When you talk about freedom of speech and who protects that freedom of speech, you're talking to a Marine and you're about to talk to a Navy SEAL, people who would give their lives to defend the freedom of speech. I understand that probably as well as anybody. But let me be clear, this is not about a First Amendment issue. Rashida Tlaib has the right to spew anti-Semitic vitriol and even call for the destruction of the Jewish state. But the House of Representatives also has the right to make it clear that her hate speech 
does not reflect the opinion of the chamber, and that's what this resolution is about. When you talk about from the river to the sea, we talked about this with the parliamentarian. We talked about it with legal counsel. We talked about precedent. We got the intel committee to make sure that the facts were straight. We did our homework on the whether there is a precedence on this. If this is not worthy of censure, what is? When you can call for the annihilation of a country and its people, if that's not worthy of a censure, what is? So first of all, he speaks as a former Navy SEAL. So that means he knows what free speech is. And then he says he's verified the facts with the House Intelligence Committee. So, okay, we have to just trust their word. But also he says, if this isn't worthy of censure, then what is? Well, how about, you know, Brian Mast, another member of Congress who's a Republican, who basically said that there's no distinction between the civilians of Gaza and Hamas. Or Lindsey Graham, who said that we should flatten Gaza. I mean, maybe that's worthy of censure because that's all, after all, calling for genocide and justifying on the grounds that there's no difference between civilians and and members of Hamas. Right. I don't know. Th those are some candidates I could think of as being worthy for censure rather than someone who just wants her people not to be slaughtered. I think it's too direct. The problem is they actually were calling for genocide. So they don't get into trouble. Whereas Rashida, because she was not calling for genocide, she does get into trouble. I, guess I think that's, that's the, the, the backwards logic. And by the way, you know, Rashida Tlaib is in very good um, company because, you know, the only other person who was censured, the only other member of Congress who was censured was someone named uh, Joshua Reed Giddings. And he was censured uh, in 1842 for violating the gag rule against discussing slavery in the House of Representatives. And he proposed a bunch of uh, resolutions against federal support for slavery. So, there we go. Let's hear from another member of Congress. Uh, the previous speaker was Rich McCormick. He was a Marine. He said we're going to hear from a Navy SEAL as well, and that is Derek Van Orden of Wisconsin. I'd like to remind my dear friend from Maryland that the Founding Fathers did not envision Twitter, but the Nuremberg War Crimes Tribunals decided that genocide, in fact, is a felony then they should probably be upset over what Israel's doing right now. Spoiler think, alert, they're not. Think. When I retired from the SEAL teams in 2014, I vowed that I would defend the Jewish people if any of the horrors that took place on October, October 7th, 2023 were to occur. And following the murder of the innocents that took place on October 7th, I fulfilled that promise by visiting Israel. All right. So when he retired from the SEALs in 2014, he vowed to protect Israel in case October 7th, 2023 happened. So he's a time traveler. Aaron. Is he a time traveler? Did he's he have a time a traveler. Ball? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Is that what yeah. you get at the Navy SEAL retirement yeah. ceremony? Is a they usually ball? they usually keep it a secret. He dropped, but he uh, he uh, dropped the ball. Yeah. And then he says he defended Israel by traveling there. I'm not sure what that contributed to Israel's self defense, but Maybe because he's so magical. Maybe he maybe he shared with them his time travel crystal ball. That's true, right? He gave them attacks. magic That's, powers. He handed it over on that super on that special mission. Yeah. Let's keep going. I ask you today, Mr. Speaker, if you had the chance to stop the Holocaust, would you? I call upon my you yield me thirty seconds. <laughs> Move to yield for another thirty seconds, please. Gentleman's recognized for thirty seconds. He's like, I really gotta land. The pitch here. I really got to nail this Holocaust analogy. Just give me 30 more seconds, please. I call upon my fellow colleagues from both parties to say yes. We would stop the Holocaust. We will not stay silent as the 21st century Holocaust unfolds before our very eyes. We will not. If there's a Holocaust analogy to make here, it's the genocide of already 10,000 civilians in just one month by Israel with US support. And rather than call out that genocide, that Holocaust, they're supporting it. And they're censuring the one Palestinian American member of Congress who's calling it out. Right. It really truly is like Freaky Friday inversion flipped reality on its head. Yeah, unbelievable. Well, for Isn't That Weird, uh, let's take a look at this uh, Israeli comedy show that is trying to mock Col uh, Columbia University's uh, pro-Palestine protesters. Hi, everyone. We are live in 
YouTube with Colombia Antisemity News, where everyone is welcome. LGBTQH. H. Hamas. <laughs> yeah, I totally sim Hamas. Yeah. It's so trending right now. From the, the river, river to, to the, the sea, sea, Palestine, Palestine will, will be free. free. Do you know why it's true? Mm. Because it rhymes. Oh. <laughs> Just look at all this toxic Zionist propaganda. Kid lived in Gaza. Does this look like Gaza to you? Yeah, bro, I have no idea what Gaza looks like. And they're small. Can we stop watching? This is brutal. This is the worst thing I've ever seen. Aaron, and it's the least I think we get the do. picture. No, I, I can't take any more you of can't? this. But it, I, this does underscore to me that, you know, and we can say this as Jews, Kate. I really feel that Israel, on top of being... Uh, a murderous chauvinistic state it also really ruins everything that's good about jewish culture i mean this is a good like example humor. like like humor i mean so much funny jewish humor there's so much funny jewish humor and and the israelis are even depriving us of that right. um that's how twisted this this israeli state has become and trying to speak for the Jewish people and become yeah. a Jewish state. You end up diluting everything to chauvin because of your belief in supremacy right. and chauvinism, it kind of kills everything else, not just people, but also the essence, the, like the spirit of the culture itself. And that is just cringe. And I'm sorry, so I can't bad. watch anymore. All that. right. Yeah, I understand. I'm I'll be a supportive uh show partner and, and not subject you to the rest. But for people who didn't watch it or just listening, they're wearing like they have like color like wigs that have dyed hair and they're wearing like pre-palestine stuff and when they did from the river to the sea they did like a little dance it was so stupid and this is like their highest rated or second highest rated comedy show so yeah it's true it's true that does not they do not speak for us or joke for us not funny they ruin everything jewish no they don't ruin it they i mean they ruin it over there luckily there's still jewish humor around Okay, well, speaking of ruining everything, we're going to stay on this theme of Israel. And for Isn't That Terrible, check out how the Israeli military is trying to sell its assault on Gaza by wrapping it in the rainbow flag. And here's the tweet from Social Impact Israel. This is what they said. And it has a, a by the way, it's a soldier holding a, a, a Jewish Star of David flag, an Israeli flag, but there's rainbow on the on the edges. And he's standing in front of a huge tank. Okay. And this is what Social Impact Israel says. Israel's LGBT community is playing a broad role on all fronts in the war against Hamas, fighting in Gaza, helping the displaced, promoting advocacy. So they want us to feel good about their assault on Gaza because some members of the LGBTQ community are taking part and even carrying the rainbow flag as they do it. Yeah, I like this idea that LGBTQ members of Gaza are going to be happy if they are killed by LGBTQ members of the Israeli army. I'm sure that's a liberating way to die. I'm sure they're happier than that than if if it were straight soldiers. Yeah, that's that's true intersectionality. Also, in that same tweet, they have a Hamas is ISIS. I'm so tired of that claim. If if Hamas really were ISIS, and you don't have to like Hamas to to say this, but if they were ISIS, does anyone honestly think ISIS would release four hostages for humanitarian reasons? Yeah, I mean, actually, Hamas and ISIS have fought before, and Israel is forgetting that inside Syria, it supported ISIS. It yeah. treated wounded ISIS fighters. It gave weapons to armed rebels who fought alongside ISIS, and... That's why the one time ISIS accidentally uh, sent a missile across the Israeli border, ISIS apologized because Israel and ISIS were basically de facto allies in the war in Syria to overthrow the Syrian government. So if there's any parallel here between Israel and ISIS, it's that they're on the same side when it's convenient for them. Wow. Well, those are your four basic food groups. We are so excited to be talking to Yanis Varoufakis. He is a Greek economist and politician. Um, and he was the uh, finance minister of Greece. He's also the author of several books, including his most recent book, Techno Feudalism What Killed Capitalism. Thank you so much for joining us, Yanis. It's a great pleasure, Katie. Thank you for having me. Of course. Um, 
we're excited to talk to you. You are someone who's been extremely principled on so many issues and you've suffered some cancellations and pushbacks for that, which is always a good sign. What is your analysis of what is happening right now uh, in Gaza that has gotten you into so much trouble? Well, I don't have many more insights than anybody else who watches the news. Uh, this awful sequence of uh, savagery that comes to us from, from Gaza. Uh, what is clear to me is that we have um, a 75-year-old problem, which is spinning completely out of control. Uh, it is, um, if you want, it's the tombstone of the West's credibility regarding the Palestinian issue. Because um, if you ask uh, Joe Biden, what's the solution to all this? He'll say, oh, the two-state solution. And yet we have a prime minister in Israel whose life ambition was to destroy the two-state solution. And uh, he succeeded. Ariel Sharon first and then Netanyahu. Uh, so Netanyahu, Netanyahu becomes prime minister with the intention of destroying any credibility that the Palestinian Authority has amongst Palestinians. He did this very successfully. Humiliated, completely corrupted, and diminished the Palestinian Authority Ramallah in West Bank. Essentially, making it abundantly clear to Palestinians that if they want any kind of representation, it will be the Islamist Hamas. And then, of course, that is a great gift to Hamas which um, acts brutally in response to Netanyahu's destruction of a project which Hamas never espoused, the two-state solution. Uh, and then there are mutual atrocities. <laughs> um, Hamas atrocities followed by Israel's much greater, in terms of the number of people who are, who are now dead or maimed, atrocities. And then the West comes through. And what, are they, what do they do? You know, both Joe Biden and Ursula von von der Leyen, you know, our uh, hapless <laughs> president of the European Commission, uh, a disgrace, uh, breathing and speaking disgrace, uh, who had the audacity without any authority from the European Union to go to Israel and effectively in front of two tanks of the IDF, uh, you know, egg on the Israeli army to enter Gaza what, you know, to carry out mass murder. Um, and, you know, the, so the West, both the European Union and the United States, primarily the United States, uh, essentially endorse fully the right to war crimes of the IDF, because that's what it is. It's the right to war crimes. When you switch off the water to two and a half million people, you know, that's by the Geneva Convention, a war crime. So self-defense becomes a war crime. War crime becomes self-defense for the IDF by the West, that is again a great gift, a moral gift, an ethical victory for Hamas. And of course, by fully backing Netanyahu, whose original plan was to destroy the two-state solution that Biden claims is the only solution, essentially the West is rendering itself absolutely obsolete, except that it's not obsolete. It is a great backer of a 70-year-old um, crime against logic, let alone humanity. So this is, if you want, more or less my take. In the end, the, the, the victims of this are progressive Israelis and progressive Palestinians. And the great victors are Netanyahu on the one hand and Hamas on the other. So the West has uh, conspired to ensure that the extremists are in power in both sides of the equation. And um, that all we have is a generalized massacre. And can you talk about the petition that you at DM25 have organized against um, Ursula von Leon, but also uh, von der Leon? But can you also just explain to people what DM25 is? DM25 is a movement that we started in Berlin back in 2016. Uh, and a large number of us, we uh, went to a theater, you know, because when they, <laughs> they turn our parliaments and congresses into theater, <laughs> into drama, we have to turn the theaters into parliaments. And so we created what we call the Democracy in Europe movement. Uh, we put together that acronym because of Carpe Diem, right? I mean, you've right. seen the movie, haven't you? <laughs> the dead, dead Poet Society. So Carpe Diem sees the day. Um, and we're trying to create something that never existed before in Europe, to have a transnational democratic movement where you're not part of it as a Greek or as a German or as a French person or Italian person, but you are there as a European who is striving for a democratized, democratized European Union because there is no democracy in Brussels whatsoever. It's a democracy-free zone. And you can see that. You asked me about Ursula von der Leyen. Okay, 
Who's in front of the line for the average American viewer audience uh, is the president of the European Commission. But do they know how she was appointed? How to, how did she become president of the European Commission? This is a rhetorical question. I'll answer. Angela Merkel, who used to be the Chancellor of Germany, uh, fully democratically elected. I disagree with her on everything. She was fully democratically elected, but she had, you know she appointed her cabinet. One of the people she appointed was Ursula von der Leyen as a defense minister. Now, Ursula von der Leyen was a spectacular, catastrophic failure, um, a combination of corruption and incompetence. She's a, there's a court case against her in Germany. She's being uh, uh, looked into by the authorities, by the judicial um, mechanisms within the Federal Republic of Germany for corruption. So she failed completely, and Angela Merkel wanted to get rid of her. So what she did was she appointed the president of the European Commission, because the president of the European Commission is not elected, it's appointed. And of course, you know, who appoints the uh, those who are appointed in the European Commission? The, the greater powers. Germany with the solicitation of France. So she was appointed president of the European Commission. One of the first things she had to do when she became president of the European Commission was to handle the pandemic. She messed this up in a mind-bogglingly efficient way. That the efficiency concerns the way she messed it up. She forgot to, um, to order vaccines. She just forgot. She claims she would have forgotten. Uh, so that was a major fiasco. Everybody talked about it. And, you know, this person who answers to no one, she has been elected by no one. She's only there because she failed as a defense minister of the Federal Republic of Germany. The moment that this new flare-up of the old uh, time-honored catastrophe in the Middle East the moment it flared up, she takes a plane without consulting with anyone, without representing the European Council, the European Parliament. And she goes to Israel and stands in front of those two tanks with two machine gunners and says, go, 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 IDF. Uh, so, you know, this is if, if Europe wanted to discredit itself in the, in the eyes of every um, fair thinking person on the planet. That's what they would, they, they would have done. So we started the petition. We've gathered 65,000 verified signatures so far for her removal. We need to get rid of her. <laughs> we never appointed her. We might as well get rid of her. Good luck with that. I'll sign that. I'll sign that. Not that a, an Amer a New York, uh, a New Yorker's uh, f signature will do that much, but maybe, but I'm, I'm Jewish. So you can count, uh, you can start, I'll start the Jews against uh, Ursula. Contingent. Of course. Yeah. We're internationalists. We exactly. Have, BMW 5 has a, a New York City. Oh, wow. Chart. I didn't there know that. Are. All right. I'll have to <laughs> look into that. You've spoken a lot about how uh, I, I heard you during a DM uh, uh, Zoom or teaching or webinar the other day ask how much Palestinian blood is required to cleanse the hands of Europe to cleanse the consciences of Europe uh, for their, you were being rhetorical, obviously, but for their guilt over anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. And then I also heard you do an, uh, a Marxist analysis of anti-Semitism. Can you talk about anti-Semitism through that Marxist lens and also how that is being paid um, with the blood of Palestinians right now, that, price, that crime? Well, anti-Semitism is a vile, perhaps the vilest form of racism. And we created it here in Europe. It's us Europeans who are responsible for anti-Semitism. Uh, the potted political economy, uh, economic history of anti-Semitism, which you mentioned very kindly, uh, that I presented yesterday in Zoom, is, is really very simple. Uh, we know that anyone who is different who is other, has a different religion, a different uh, look, uh, in our communities, in our societies, usually magnetizes discrimination. We see this from uh, kindergartens, from primary schools. Children that happen to, you know, to be left-handed and write with the left hand are bullied by the other children. Otherness is punished through discrimination. Especially if you have a different religion, like the Jews of the diaspora had, especially after you know, your people were thrown out of Spain and dispersed across uh, the European continent from Scotland all the way to Ukraine and to Crimea and to, you know, to, to Greece, Thessaloniki, Constantinople in uh, uh, the Ottoman Empire. 
you've ended up in a European continent under feudalism. Feudalism is a system which is based on land ownership. So either you are a landed aristocrat uh, and you have power, and Jews were not that because they were not allowed to own land, or you were a peasant who was bonded, bonded labor, bonded farm labor to the aristocrats. And you were not at that either, because you know, you're not allowed to be either aristocrats or to be peasants. So what did you do? You stayed in towns and you stayed on the sidelines of feudal societies. And you did the only thing that you could do, given that you had no connection to the land, either as owner, owners or as being owned by the land. Commerce. You bought and sold things. And you were not the only ones. Uh, I mentioned that yesterday. Uh, some of my people, because we were also occupied and a lot of the Greeks were thrown off their lands by the Ottomans. Um, there were Greeks in Odessa, next to the Jews, uh, next to the Armenians, who were also another people that had a large diaspora as a result of being occupied and being thrown off their land. And, you know, our peoples uh, became quite adept at commerce. That's why, you know, most of shipping today is, is Greek, because of that legacy. And the, what the Jewish religion had as a characteristic which made a significant difference to the way in which uh, the, the Jews operated was, you know, un unlike the other two monotheistic religions, Christianity and um, Islam, uh, Judaism does not ban charging interest for lending money. So given that you were buying and selling things, not you, but, you know, your people, had a, a tendency that, that was the only thing they could, they could do. Uh, they also lent money and borrowed money with interest. This is why Shylock in uh, Shakespeare's Merchant on Venice is Jewish, because he could actually charge interest. And that was very useful to the local society who wanted to, to, to borrow and lend, right? Uh, it took a long time. It took Protestantism for Christianity to, to accept interest payment mm -hmm. as being legitimate, not being usury, not being a sin against God. Uh, and then suddenly something happens in the, at the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Capitalism, right? So power shifts away from land ownership to capital ownership. And commerce takes off. Nothing to do with the Jews. <laughs> it just took off. It had to do with the British and the Dutch in Amsterdam. That's where capitalism grew out of. Okay? But because your people, <laughs> the Jews, were occupying important nodes in the commercial network, you got rich. Not all of you. Right. 20% of the Jewish people got very rich as a result. And the Greeks too. I mentioned the shipping, shipping owners or, you know, of the Greek diaspora. But there were many more Jews in the Jewish diaspora than Greeks in the Greek diaspora. Okay? And at the same time, you know, and this, this, for me, this is crucial. In places like Constantinople, places like Odessa, Places like Thessaloniki, which I know very well, it's the second largest city in Greece today, uh, which was, a, by the way, it was a Jewish city up until the Holocaust, right? When Thessaloniki became Greek, I don't know whether you know that, there were 120,000 uh, people living there, of whom 80, 85,000 were Jews. Oh. So the, the bourgeoisie, the rich, the factory owners, the ship owners were Jewish, but the proletarian were, the proletarian were also Jewish. And indeed, there was a fantastic uh, organization, uh, trades union, called the, the Federacion, which was 100% Jewish. Mm. And they started the socialist movement in the Balkans and the Socialist Party of Greece, which then became the Communist Party of Greece. So you had the bankers and you had the communists, and they were <laughs> Jews. <laughs> but because of the otherness, your people were, have, have the distinction, in inverted commas, of being, you are the only people who are despised both for being poor, poor and for being rich. And mm. uh, so, you know, the, 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 every time there was a crisis of capitalism, brought it brought out all those tensions. And there was a pogrom against the Jews in Odessa, in uh, in Greece, in Pe the Peloponnese. My grandmother, you know, who was born in uh, 1895, was telling me stories of the pogroms of the Jews. So, anti-Semitism is deeply embedded in. European feudalism and its transition to capitalism. And of course, that culminated into the Holocaust, which is uniquely evil. I never relativize the Holocaust. There is no evil done in the world 
which compares with the Holocaust. There were many genocides, many, the Armenian genocide, the genocide of the Pontian Greeks, of the Algerians by the French, of, you know, the Kenyans by the British. There are lots of genocides. <laughs> but Holocaust, there was only one, because the Nazis were like stamp collectors. You know how crazy a stamp collector is? He wants, it's usually a it's a he, never a she. Uh, the stamp collector wants all the stamps. If there is one stamp missing from his collection, he will go mad. He won't be able to sleep at night. That's the Nazis. They wanted to collect all the Jews and kill them all. No genocide was ever intended to kill everybody. So when the Turks committed genocide against the Armenians, they didn't want to kill every Armenian. They killed a lot of Armenians in order to scare off the rest to leave Turkey. Uh, they didn't care if, I mean, if they left the country, fine. <laughs> they, they didn't want to collect all of them and kill them in gas chambers. So the Holocaust is absolutely unique, and we Europeans are to blame for that. And not just the Germans, let us not make this mistake. The Nazi Greeks during the 1940s were just as bad as the, the, the Nazi Germans. The Nazi Croats were so cruel to the Jews that the German Nazis felt a bit squeamish watching the, the Nazi Croats. So this is, you know, this is a crime against humanity, against the Jews, by Europeans. And what do we do after that? At some point, with the Balfour Declaration, essentially, you know, the British started the, the, this whole thing about enabling all the Jews to go to Palestine. Now, I don't have anything against the Jews going to Palestine. You know what I have a problem against? The idea of terra nullius. Yeah. <laughs> the idea that, you know, you remember the Zionist uh, expression? A land without a people. Or a people, or a people without, without a land, right. You know, this is what the British did in, in South Africa. They declared the land, and in Australia, they declared the land to be empty of humans. In other words, the humans who were there were not humans and therefore could be killed at will. And they did it. I mean, in Australia, they killed all the aborigines. I mean, there were five and a half million aborigines. There are 110,000 now. It was just a very successful eradication, right. complete eradication. Right, so there's a tradition of doing that in Europe, um, and that was applied to the Jews by the Germans scientifically with a stamp collector's mania. But we're all responsible for that. And you know, do you, uh, do, I'm sure you, you've heard that that King George, the present king's grandfather, Queen Elizabeth's dad, uh, in 1948, 1949, in some party, he has been uh, reported as saying very casually, that the problem, this is, I'm quoting him now, the problem with Mr. Hitler is that he made the moderate anti-Semitism impossible. Oh, you know, I didn't that, know that, yeah. That was the attitude of, 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 of the European ruling class, that anti-Semitism was essential, but, you know, Hitler overdid it, and he yeah, does not allow us to So, you know, the idea that we will get rid of all the Jews uh, from the Holocaust becomes, send them to Palestine, send them to Israel. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and we will uh, support Israel um, in essentially committing genocide, not Holocaust. I'm not relativizing. Huh? In the same way that the European settlers got rid of um, blacks in South Africa to create tot fully white areas, apartheid. Uh, well, they will, you know, the, the Israelis will do the same thing to the Palestinians, and Europe will support them. That way, we cleanse our guilt for the Holocaust. And the question I'm asking. This is a very long answer to a, <laughs> a short question. Um, so I apologize about that. No, the question great. I'm asking, especially I'm putting it to my German friends, who think that, you know, if you, if you don't support Israel, come what may, you're being anti-Semitic, which is madness. Absolute madness. And anti-Semitic in itself. Yeah. So I'm asking them, okay, how much Palestinian blood will it take to wash off your sense of guilt over the Holocaust? How many tons of Palestinian blood? Can do, do you think that, that that is a clever way of washing off your guilt over the Holocaust? I don't think so. Uh, to what extent will you continue to support the genocide of the Palestinians by the Israeli state before you realize that this is the kind of thing which reinforces the logic behind anti-Semitism? It right. does not detract from it. Right, and it also is anti-Semitic to suggest that Jews are a monolith who all stand with Israel, which is in itself a, an anti-Semitic trope or the dual loyalty yeah, trope, that these people are 
it's interesting because the the people who conflate being Jewish with being a Zionist are rabid anti-Semites who use those terms interchangeably, and then Israel, the government of Israel, and the ADL and APEC. Indeed, indeed. Look, any any sentence beginning with the Jews right, no. is wrong, is, is racist. In the same way that any sentence beginning with the Greeks is racist. If you, if you, any, you know, whatever you put under the, after the Greeks, the Greeks believe that. Right. It's wrong. Because you know what? I mean, I'm in Athens now. I can see my neighbors here around where I live. I disagree with everything. <laughs> with all of them. <laughs> so there's no sentence which can sum up what we all think. What we're all like. What, what we all dislike. Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Um, any statement about the Jews or the Germans or the Americans, for that matter, is racist. And And what is motivating... What in the Marxist analysis is motivating Europe to um, back Israel in this genocide? Is it just the collective guilt or is there a material basis for this? The, the, there is no great material benefit directly. But you may have noticed that the European Union, uh, especially in the last 10, 13 years, especially after the great financial collapse of 2008, the European Union has lost its way. It has lost its capacity to reproduce itself economically, financially. Um, let me say, Katie, that back in 2007, uh, Europe, Europe's total income, what we call GDP, was slightly larger than that of the United States. Now it's 60% of the level of the United States. Europe has been fading economically. We are increasingly divided. I mean, you know, when I was finance minister, there was a big clash between the North and the South. That was eight years ago. Now there is a big clash between the East and the West and the North and the South. So increasingly fragmented and divided. And especially after the war in Ukraine, any capacity of the President of France, the Chancellor of Germany, the Prime Minister of Italy, huh, the Prime Minister of Spain, to come up with any disagreement with Washington, D.C., whoever happens to be in government in Washington, whether it's Trump or Joe Biden, doesn't matter. That capacity has withered. It has gone away. I know it for a fact that Emmanuel Macron does not agree with Joe Biden's position on the war in Ukraine. I know that Olaf Scholz doesn't agree. They won't say it because the moment they start whispering any disagreement with Washington DC, they get destroyed by the media. So you have a situation where the European Union simply doesn't exist anymore as a geopolitical entity. It doesn't have a foreign policy. It has no defense policy. It doesn't even have an economic policy. Uh, and therefore, it simply mimics whatever is coming from Washington, D.C. I think that, to a very large extent, explains the fact that we no longer have, you know, someone like François Mitterrand, the president of France, or uh, Helmut Kohl, or um, uh, Jacques Chirac, another president of France, uh, or may even Schroeder, the former Chancellor of Germany, who actually opposed American policy in the Middle East. Remember when George W. decided to invade Iraq and effectively cause the death of a million people um, in a way that diminished diminished the standing of the United States. <laughs> it didn't even increase the hegemony of the United States. Um, France and Germany disagreed with, uh, with, with the United States and said, no, not in our name. We are not participating in this stupid invasion of Iraq. Now that would never happen, even and if they do. Even we had if freedom they fries. Remember, we and then we had freedom fries in response. We couldn't call them French fries here anymore. I know, I know. So, <laughs> sorry, I cut you <laughs> off. That was embarrassing, though. Yeah, I remember. I know that. Yeah. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I know freedom fries. <laughs> what do you make of the uh, protests we've seen against uh, the war in Gaza here in the U.S., where we are just had the biggest pro-Palestinian protest ever. I know in Europe there's been major protests too. Uh, workers at ports, like in Barcelona, have refused to load ships that are said to be bound for Israel to uh, provide weapons. Are those protests making any difference in, in European capitals? Not immediately. None whatsoever immediately. But that was never the intention of those protests. And the protesters are not dumb. They know that they're not going to change things overnight. But they do have a major positive effect on the psychology of Palestinians, both in Palestine 
and outside of Palestine. Uh, they need our support because they, you know, they, I know Palestinians who are too frightened to walk outside. I know Israelis who are too frightened to walk outside. So, you know, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, Arabophobia has completely skyrocketed. So uh, this is why I try to, when, because I participate in many of these um, protests, I try to make the point that the protests in favor of Palestinians are also protests of solidarity with our Israeli and Jewish comrades who are suffering immensely under the regime of Netanyahu and the apartheid regime. Because there's nothing worse for me. You know what? I, I, it may sound far-fetched, but I, I truly feel that in my bones. I would much rather be a Palestinian suffering the slings and arrows of uh, the wrath of settlers and the IDF that being a progressive Israeli in Tel Aviv, in Haifa today, uh, being portrayed by my fellow Jews and Israelis as a traitor of my race. This must be extremely hard. So we need solidarity for the people who will have to create a peaceful Israel-Palestine. That's what we need. I think that in the long run, these demonstrations are working. They are eroding the propaganda, the cast iron solid view that the Israeli state is in danger and needs to be defended by the West. The Israeli state doesn't need to be de defended by the, the West. There's no doubt that the Jewish communities need to be defended <laughs> from anti-Semitism. But the state of Israel is ironclad, nuclear armed. It's got a, the, the, the most technologically advanced army probably in the world. The state of Israel is not under threat. Um, if there's anybody who is under threat from the river to the sea, it's the Palestinians. It is not the Israelis. So we, we, we need to return a little, bit, a little bit of sanity and solidarity with everyone who is working for peace, Palestinians and Israelis. Sorry, before I, I cut you off by mentioning the Freedom Prize, you were saying, I want to make sure that you get the chance to finish your thought. You were saying that you don't have any of the people like Chirac, who stood in the way or opposed what um, the yeah. U.S. was doing in in, uh, in the Middle East, and you were saying, and even if you, if even if they did, well, even if they secretly oppose what the United States is doing, that you know, our presidents and prime ministers in Europe um, are too scared to actually express these disagreements, unlike what was happening in previous decades, and that is a major defeat of European democracy when politicians are too scared to speak their minds. When it comes to the war in Ukraine, things are not looking very good for people who have supported this, this proxy war rather than supporting uh, diplomacy to end it. Uh, Time magazine recently came out with this article interviewing Zelensky and his top aides. And these aides to Zelensky told Time that he's delusional, that he refuses to even discuss the reality that Ukraine is not winning. It's barely advanced in this widely hyped counteroffensive. The top Ukrainian uh, commander, Zeluzhny, recently said this war is at a stalemate. There was a report in NBC News recently that Ukraine is being slightly nudged toward negotiations by the U.S. after the U.S. previously blocked negotiations, basically. Um, what is your sense of how this proxy war is going now and, and what has been its impact on, on Europe? And to hear the rest of the interview, please go to UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. That was great. Wonderful. And again, Yanis Varoufakis's new book coming out soon in the U.S. is called Techno-Feudalism, What Killed Capitalism? And make sure you subscribe to hear the full interview with Yanis, where we talk about why Bernie Sanders is doing what he's doing or not doing what he should be doing when it comes to Gaza. Oh, Bernie. It's Bernard. a real, it's a sad one. But, you know, on the plus side... There are all these Bernie staffers and other uh, staffers in Congress who are calling out their bosses for being sure. complicit. Yeah. There are protests going on on Capitol Hill led by staffers, you know, demanding a ceasefire. So even though the lawmakers are dropping the ball, including Bernie, some of their staffers are are trying to fill the void and trying to be the conscience that their bosses refuse to be. And I also want to give a shout out to Jewish Voice for Peace for doing another protest. Uh, this week, they were at the Statue of Liberty. I was actually there as well. 
It was pretty stunning. They hung uh, banners that said ceasefire now from the actual pedestal of the Statue of Liberty. And um, yeah, they're doing great stuff. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks so much for listening to and watching Useful Idiots. For extended episodes, bonus content, and our weekly Thursday Throwdown episode, please subscribe at UsefulIdiotsPodcast.com. Support the show for free by subscribing on YouTube, Rumble, and wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the podcast, don't forget to rate and review. You can also follow us on Twitter at UsefulIdiotPod. Thanks for supporting independent media. We'll see you next time.